may be cold outside, and hopefully you feel the warmth of the congregation as you participate with us this day. You'll uh, want to note that uh, it's a good time now to register your attendance, and you can use the fellowship pad is on the seat closest to the center aisle, or you can go to our website or to the uh, QR code that you see above you and be able to register your attendance with us that way and find out more information about the life of the church. So we are so pleased that you are here today to participate. You'll notice on the back of your worship sheet this week of the activities that are coming up and also obviously you can go to our website and check the uh, calendar of all the activities going on during Lent as we move toward the Easter day. Please stand now as you would and as you are able as we join together in this call to worship. We are on a journey of faith. Jesus is our leader and our guide. On the daylight hour, as the daylight hours grow longer, our journey takes on an urgency. Do not fear. God goes before us into Jerusalem, into the world. Amen. to this day to proclaim God in our presence and in our lives. Let us join now together as we join in these words of affirmation of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and I'm pleased to invite Joe and Jen Penn, Pien to come and present their son for baptism. They have people with them who've probably traveled the furthest for baptism of anyone in a long time. So we are glad to have their, their family here gathered with them as well. Thank you. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of Jesus, how he said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Jen and Joe, I ask you now these questions on behalf of the church. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression wherever find, form it might find itself? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church through Jesus Christ, which has opened up to all people, all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. Will you nurture your son in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to perfect, profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. And to you, the congregation, we now ask these two questions. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. Will you nurture one another in Christ's life, in the Christian life and faith, and include this child that we now comes before you in your care? If so, responds to the words you'll see on this screen. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this world with the community of love and faithfulness that we may grow in strength to others. We will pray for him, that he may be a true disciple who walks in a way that leads to life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. 
pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and he who will receive it, to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. What name is given this child? Conrad Tungi. Come see me. Let's go on this side so everybody over there can see you. Conrad Songyu Pien, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May that Holy Spirit work within you each day of your life until you confirm the decision that was made by your parents and their grand grandparents and all those who gather with you this day. Amen. Conrad, would you like to go meet all these people? You know these people. <laughs> Take a look. Take a look. They're not that scary. Some of them. <laughs> it is not just this family who faithfully gathers here. Their responsibility to raise this child in a life of faith. They are going to be fine Christian examples to him each and every day. But it is all of your their, their gathered village who gathers around them and their extended village who gathers around them to help him in a life of faith. I trust that all of you will help take responsibility to help raise him, even the choir, that they will help raise him in the Christian faith and help him so to live in such a way that he reflects as his parents do the love of Christ in all that they do. May we pray together. Gracious and loving God, we ask that you pour out your richest blessings upon these parents and upon this family who has gathered from across the world to celebrate newness of life. Help us to take your good news from this place through the life of children like this. We ask that you pour your richest blessings upon Conrad and help him to become all that you have called him to be. Exceed his parents' wildest expectations for who he will become as he follows in a life of faith. Bless them now. And may we look forward to the day together where he accepts you and follows you with his full heart. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we give thanks for this holy moment. Amen. Amen. God bless you. As we come to a time of prayer, I invite you to find the prayer concerns of this congregation and this community on the back of the bulletin today. These are updated throughout the week on the church website. I hope that you will keep all of these folks in your prayers during the coming week. Family has already been to worship once. They came to the nine o'clock service. And uh, they will be exiting right now, but don't take that personally. I certainly won't. They have already been to one worship service as they have faithfully uh, gotten up very early to worship with us. There are several people who are coming to renew their vows of membership today. John Ritchie, David and Marilyn Dalrymple, Chuck and Sharon Cape. I invite them to join me at the altar during a time of prayer and they can kneel as they're able. Nell Butler, Nicole Norgard, Wade and Sally Wright, Mallard and Pam Holiday, Barbara Roth, Joanne Akers, Jane Mallory, Ed and Teresa Kennedy. And joining us online and renewing their vows at home are Judy and Sally Murphy, Lynn Perry and Gray and Jana Lindsay. During each month, we will be uh, 
asking people to come forward and renewing the vows that they made in the month of March or the month of April, whatever month it was that they joined the church so many years ago. And I have good news for you. Calissa Dodderman, where are you this morning? In the choir. Will you stand? The Board of Ministry is wise because they have affirmed Calissa's gifts for ministry and she will be ordained as a full connection deacon in the United Methodist Church in Athens in June. They said it took all of a minute to deliberate. Will you join me as you feel led at the altar while Kathy leads us in prayer? This morning we extend our Christian sympathy to Pamela Bean and family on the death of her mother, Mary Ellen. And to Lisa Stammer and family on the death of her mother, Peggy Kynock. And to David Woodrow and family on the death of his wife, Cindy, mother of Dave Woodrow and Chrissy Taylor and families. And now let us go to God in a time of silent prayer followed by the pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we come together to worship you this day. We are a people who would like to think that we love you with all our hearts and souls, with all our strength. But there's so many other things in our lives that clamor for our attention that we often relegate you to Sunday mornings and times when we want you to rescue us. Most of us really do want you to be the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We really do want to hear your voice above all of the other voices in our lives. But we get bogged down. We get bogged down in the daily routine. We forget who we are. We forget who you are. And we forget what the church is supposed to be. So here we are, oh God, standing before you today with our human weakness and our short attention spans, asking that you would make yourself known to us that you would help us to recognize the presence of the holy, that you would continue to challenge us, to inspire us, and to make us into the people you want us to be. Open our eyes, O God, that we might see what the good Samaritan saw. Grant us the insight to see the need in others, the wisdom to know what to do, and the will to do it. God of peace, we pray this day for the people of Ukraine, for all who are fleeing their homes and their livelihoods to find safety for themselves and for their family members. We pray also for the people of Russia, O God, for all who are lifting arms against neighbors and for all who watch in horror. We pray for the leaders of this world and we pray for peace throughout the world. This day, O God, we pray for all who are ill in body, mind, or spirit, and for all who grieve the death of loved ones. Loving God, open our eyes that we might not cross the road from human need. Give us a deep love for you that we might see your love at work in this world and that we might go and do likewise. All of this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
in response to the wondrous love that God has for each of us and for this world. There are many ways that you can respond. And one of those ways is by your giving. You can give either in the offering plate or by scanning that code or bringing it to the church office. But the other way you can give is through your presence. This week, this Saturday, is the great day of service. And if you haven't already signed up to be a part of that, we invite you to go online and find a place that you would like to serve. Another way that you can give back is by finding the Amazon wish list. We still need items to go into some of the blessing bags and some of the buckets that we'll be putting together. So now as the ushers come forward to receive our offering, let us give back to God a small portion of that which God has blessed us with.
Amen. You may be seated. Friends, I have to tell you, this is my least favorite day of the year, and not just because it's my brother's birthday. (laughs) I don't like the time change. In fact, I just put my clock ahead 10 minutes a day for each day this week. I was early to everything, but I just kind of got there ahead of the rest of you. I could do without the time change, so I'm thankful that you're faithfully here at uh, 12.15 or whatever time it is that uh, you've just got here. Spring, I I can never remember. I have a question for you this morning. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Look across to the other side of the sanctuary and just ask them, whose side are you on? Look look up in the balcony and ask them, the choir, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on in these days when the rules of civility seem to have been thrown out the window? In these days when a certain gentleman in Moscow has the whole world in upheaval, I prefer to turn to the other Amor Tolls novel. Any fans out there? I turn to the Lincoln Highway for a bit of fanciful escape away from this gentleman in Moscow and toward the Lincoln Highway, where we hear from the words of Wallace Woolley Wolcott, who is worried about the W, the poor W, because the W is often the beginning of a question. The W is often the beginning of a question. Who, what, where? when, why, and which. Wooly worries about the W because that is a lot of burden for one letter to have to carry. It turns out that all those W words come from one word in Old English, quad. Try it. It's really what. It gets to be what in translations. And what time is when, what person is who, and they all proceed from that word what. And that's why in the German and in the English, they begin with a W. Woolley also says that too often when a question comes and it begins even with one of those W words, people are not really asking a question, they are making a statement in disguise. You ever been to a committee meeting when someone asks a question that is not really a question or at a conference and someone comes up to the microphone during the Q&A or at a Congress session, right, Fran? They come and they want to ask a question. It's not a question at all. They just want to make a statement. And that seems to be what happened in our scripture text today. Whose side are you on? It seems to be one of the favorite questions of the day. And if I can determine which side you're on, I can determine whether we ought to really have a relationship or I should even be be talking to you. Are you on the side of Russia or the Ukraine? Are you on the side of the Major League Baseball Players Association or of the owners? Poor Jock Peterson and Dansby Swanson had to go work for Papa John's this week. Papa John sent out a tweet and said, if your team's not playing, how about joining ours? Come make pizzas for hungry people. You guys have too much time on your hands. Why not come work for us? And they took them up on their offer. We seem to be those who pick a side. One young man came home from college, and when he got home from college, his parents took him out to dinner, and he said, I'm not going out to dinner with you anymore because all you do is fight. You go out to dinner, and you have a fight about whether we should have mashed potatoes, french fries, or rice. It's the same time. Every time we go out, you fight about mashed potatoes, french fries, or rice. And he said, I want you to know, I'm not choosing sides. (laughs) And yet we do. 
we do choose sides. We do choose sides about the church, the future of the church. We do choose sides about, am I an inside the perimeter person or an outside the perimeter person? Who are my IT people here, ITP people? Who are my OTP people? Who are really ITP people but are having to live OTP right now? (laughs) My daughter says, all of us are ATP people. We're not inside the perimeter, we're not outside, we are at the perimeter people. And that just makes us an interesting mix of all kinds. A lawyer has stood up to test Jesus and in testing Jesus, he wants to know Jesus, just whose side are you on as he confronts Jesus with some questions that he wants Jesus to answer? These are not kind questions. It's the same word used at the temptation when he asks these questions of testing Jesus. So I invite you to stand for the who, which, what of the gospel here in the 10th chapter of Luke, beginning in the 25th verse. It's a story with which you're probably too familiar, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your? And with all your? And with all your? And with all your? and your as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to a place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and they took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the good news according to the gospel of Luke. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, help us when we are in the midst of testing and trial, not to escalate, but to engage. Help us to respond as Jesus responds to questioning with kindness and with openness and care. May we respond as the Samaritan did when we are faced with struggle that is on the other side. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. A certain Sunday school teacher was trying to teach her children this story about the Good Samaritan, and she said to the children, what would you do if you came and saw someone beaten and bleeding there by the side of the road? And after a few moments of silence, one little girl said, I think I'd throw up. (laughs) And that's what we do. We see hurt, we see pain, we see struggle, and we just want to throw up our hands at times because there is so much struggle, there is so much pain, it is so overwhelming, and we just don't know where to start. A lawyer stands up to test Jesus. And this isn't a lawyer the way that we think about lawyers today, Bob. This is a student of the law. 
This is someone who has studied the first five books of the Old Testament and is trying to discern what would please God. Not how do I stay out of the courtroom, but what are we going to do that would please God? And he stands up to test Jesus. As I said, it's not a kind interaction. He uses the word teacher, and it's really not a kind word. It's usually the opponents of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke who say, teacher. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And my quick response would be, if you want to inherit something, somebody has to die, right? If you want to inherit something, somebody has to die. Jesus is walking toward Jerusalem. He has already set his face toward Jerusalem on a collision course with the cross and with death. And he doesn't respond and tell the young lawyer that. He says to the lawyer, you've got some expertise. What do you read in the law? You've studied the Old Testament scriptures. You've studied the scriptures. What does it say there? What do you read there? And he sort of gives responsibility for the response back to the one asking the question. And he responds from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 as Jesus was probably pretty sure that he would. He says, it says in the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus nods his head and says, you've answered correctly. You have answered rightly. Now go and do this and you will live. You will live into eternity right now. You can live into the world to come. You can participate in eternal life now if you will just go out and love God and love neighbor. That's it. That is not exactly what I think that the lawyer wanted to hear. He wanted to set Jesus up. He wanted Jesus to be tripped up in this. And so as he goes to sit down, he thinks, oh, I can get him. I think I can get him with another question. And just who is my neighbor? Just who is my neighbor? I think it would have been more interesting if he'd asked, now who is this God? Who is this God that you are calling me to love with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because isn't that what Jesus came to do? Came to reveal who that God is to us? But he asked the question, who is my neighbor? My wife tried to teach this scripture passage to our four-year-old twins years and years ago. And we were living in the country. And like a good teacher, she looked at them and she said, now children... Who are our neighbors? And they thought, and that we lived in the middle of nowhere. And they thought, and they're like, there's a boy named Patrick that lives down the street. Okay. And they thought for a little while, and they said, oh, we have neighbor cows. And Elizabeth said, okay, yes, those are our neighbors. Wouldn't it be better and easier if your only neighbors were cows? If the only people you had to be neighborly to were cows, I have to be neighbors with Mark Lambeck. <laughs> and Mark, Mark had an incident the other night that he told me about. He said, some of our neighbors are really rude. One of our neighbors came and knocked on his door at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he said it didn't bother him that much because he was still up playing the accordion. We don't have an accordion for you today, but we do have the piano. <laughs> Who are the people in your neighborhood? In your neighborhood, in your neighborhood. Yes, who are the people in your neighborhood? The people that you meet each day. And yet the lawyer's question was not asked with the innocence of Sesame Street. The lawyer is asking a pointed question because what the lawyer wants is a legal definition. What the lawyer wants is to be told, who do I get to exclude? 
Who do I have to include? And I think he wants a definition like this one from Frederick Buechner. A neighbor here in F2 referred to as the party of the first part is be construed as meaning a person of Jewish descent whose legal residence is within a radius of no more than three statute miles from one's own legal residence unless there is another a person Jew, of Jewish descent here in after referred to as the party of the second part, living closer to the party of the first part than the one is oneself, in which case the party of the second part is construed to be a neighbor. I think that's what the lawyer is looking for in his answer. If he ever had to love a neighbor, he wanted to know exactly what that meant. And instead, Jesus responds in pure Jesus fashion and tells a story. A, a priest, a Levite and a Samaritan walk into a bar. <laughs> I'm not sure that's right. A priest, a Samaritan and a chicken walk into a bar and the bartender says, I'm sorry, but we don't serve jokes here. And the chicken says, that's okay. I know a place across the road. <laughs> a priest, a Levite and a Samaritan are walking down a road. It's a story we're probably a bit too familiar with. The first person to walk down the road is a religious professional like myself. And rather than stopping and getting involved, he walks by on the other side. And then a faithful religious layperson like one of you sees the need there on the other side of the road and walks by on the other side. But then a Samaritan, and it's hard for us to do justice for what a Samaritan is today. A Samaritan was someone despised. It was someone that you would, would walk on the other side of the street from. It was not someone that you wanted to get involved with. You were taught as a faithful Jew, there are we faithful Jews, and then there are the Samaritans. And they were people that the Jews did not want to associate with. So think about an issue that is important to you and think about someone who is on the other side of that issue. Got it? They're one of your Samaritans. They are the people that it would be very difficult for them to come and help you and it would be very difficult for you to accept their help. It's hard for us to get into the minds of the Jews and the Samaritans, but we know people on the other side of the issue or the other side of the aisle from us, and we know the people that we disagree with or people that we were taught to look down on or despise, right? You've got categories like that as well, and the Samaritan is the one that stops. James Moore puts it this way. He says there are three kinds of people in this story. He says the first people are those who walk through life with a cold, cold heart. And those cold-hearted people are the robbers in the story, and they take what is not theirs and don't think much about it. They are cold-hearted, and they're willing to just grab what is theirs. And then he says there are the calculating people, the people who calculate the cost-benefit analysis of helping. They see someone by the side of the road. They see someone on the other side. They see someone that's hurt or been victimized, and they start doing the mental calculus in their heads. How much should I get involved? How much do I want to get involved? If I do this, will I become unclean and not be able to be a part of some of the rituals in the temple? And they calculate through all of the scenarios and they walk by on the other side. And finally, there is the compassionate Samaritan. It never says he's good. The words good are attributed to the Samaritan. It never says that. What it says in the text is that he looked on the one who had been beaten and hurt, and he looked on that one who was beaten and hurt and had compassion. Like the fellow in this video that is a good Samaritan in Sacramento, California. Take a look. CRE 3, a woman was stuck inside this burning car on Interstate 80 until a good Samaritan stepped in. 
he was there to help me, and that, that's a blessing. This car burning on the side of the freeway Wednesday night with the Sacramento area woman stuck inside. It could have blown at any time. It went that fast. Christine Smith of Antelope says she, her husband, and their granddaughter were driving on I-80 near the Riverside exit when their trip turned tense. And I just heard the pop underneath, and I figured we had a flat tire. But whatever they hit caused the car to burst into flames. It was a struggle for Christine to get out since she just had knee surgery, and her loved ones could not help. I wasn't thinking of anybody stopping in that situation because the fire was so big. But then Elton Ward came into the picture. And then I see this car in flames, so I'm like, that's insane. Elton was driving with his daughter and knew he had to pull over. He grabbed Christine out of the burning car just in time. Literally a matter of 30 seconds, boom, first explosion. Loud, big, big explosion. Then when that explosion happens, huge flames come up. She would not <laughs> let me go. That's said, what nope. You said, but you became my grandson that day. <laughs> Elton says even though no one else did, stopping to help was the right thing to do. We all got grandmas, grandpas, little nieces, nephews, brothers, whatever. If y'all see my people, I want you to try to help my people. So that's somebody's people. CRA 3. That's somebody's people. Everyone in need is somebody's people. Somebody's people people. But this story has to be about more than if someone is in need, you ought to stop because this story makes the lawyer's blood boil. I told you last week I was to make you uncomfortable. This week I'm here to make you angry. Or Jesus is here to make you angry. I'm just telling you what the story that he told. Because when the lawyer is supposed to answer the question, which one showed mercy to this man? He doesn't say the Samaritan. He can't even get the word out. He doesn't even want to speak the Samaritan word aloud. He says the one, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus tells him to go and do likewise. What happened is this man was in need and someone who might not have thought that he should went over to the other side and did not just bind up his wounds, but he also was thorough and he cared for him, spent the night binding up his wounds and even funded his recovery. Do you think that made the lawyer mad? You're expecting me not only to help people, but to fund their recovery? I was haunted by this picture this week. It was sent to me by Sarah Greer. I don't know if you saw it, but this is a picture of some good Samaritans. These are at a Polish train station and they're empty baby carriages and strollers that were left there for the Ukrainian women and their children who were fleeing the Ukraine. And these wonderful good Samaritans left the baby carriages so that when these women fleeing their home country arrived, they would have something. They would have some glimpse of hope. Friends, we are looking today for some good Samaritans who are willing to leave their own friendly confines and go across to the other side. Whatever the other side might look like, are you ready to be a good Samaritan? Now, some of us are really good, good Samaritans, like my friend, Dr. Melissa White here in the church. She runs the trauma center at Grady. That's a good Samaritan, isn't it? That's somebody who does crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis. There is another person of compassion in this story, and he's probably my favorite person in the story. It is the innkeeper. Early in Jesus' life, there was no room for him at the inn. And now he tells the story redeeming the innkeeper because the innkeeper is the one who is there for the long haul. He is given the idea that he will be repaid someday when the Samaritan comes back and he cares for the person over the long haul in their pain. Some of us are better good Samaritans. We are able to help in the moment and move on to the next thing. Others of you are wonderful innkeepers. You've been there day in and day out for an aging parent, 
for someone with a chronic condition, for a child with special needs. You've been there day in and day out, day in and day out. Both are needed. Our world needs more good Samaritans and innkeepers more than we ever had. Turn to your neighbor and ask them, are you more of an innkeeper or a good Samaritan? Friends, too often we fail to go to the other side, and I've got news for you. Even the chicken crossed the road. Don't be chicken. Cross the road to where God is calling you in these difficult and challenging days. No matter what is on the other side for you, Jesus is pushing us to go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may you fill the world with good Samaritans and innkeepers. Whose side are you on? Jesus would say, I'm on the side of the person that's hurting the most. I'm on the side of the victim. I'm on the side of the robbers. I'm on the side of the Pharisee, the priest, and the Levite. I'll cross over whatever boundaries are put in front of me in order to bring healing and hope to the world. A charge to keep is our final hymn, and I invite you to stand and lift your voices as we are all called to keep the charge that is in front of us. Jerry Ray, when did you get married? Two years ago tomorrow. tomorrow. And then a global pandemic hit. (laughs) And you got to spend all that extra time together. Sandra, where are you? They got married this week? Week ago Friday. And we congratulate them on their new life together. And we pray that we're not moving into another global pandemic. I asked last week on each of your bulletins is a small arrow, and I ask you to take that arrow and to take it home and to point to something that really matters. One of our church members took one and it pointed it at her daughter as she is concentrating on her daughter and her daughter's care right now. Another pointed it toward a cross in their home and sent me that picture. I hope as you join us in this journey toward Jerusalem, you'll do what the Good Samaritan did. You will stop. You will stop. That is an excellent way to take on a lesson discipline, is to stop and see the person right in front of you and love the person right in front of you. We get going so quickly, we get so busy that we fail to stop 
And so I invite you to stop this week for whoever you see in need and offer the warm hand of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we lift our voices not in let there be peace on earth, but may we be peacemakers as we go from this place who follow Jesus throughout these 40 days. Amen.